Welcome to Regionally Speaking, a forum that explores the distinctive aspects of Northeast Ohio's Western Reserve. And now, introducing your host, Professor of American Studies and the Director of the Western Reserve Studies Symposium at Case Western Reserve University, Gladys Haddad. Hello, and thank you for listening to Regionally Speaking. Cities across the country are facing the worst recession since the Great Depression. How do you redevelop a city in these challenging economic times? In this series on the Social Justice Alliance Institute at Case Western Reserve University, we'll be joined by community experts and leaders, faculty and students, as we discuss these important issues for Northeastern Ohio and its central city of Cleveland. Today we welcome David Harris, founder of the Living Through Legacies Project. He received his Master of Science in Social Administration from the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences from Case Western Reserve University this May. His focus is on intergenerational linkages in bettering our communities. The Living Through Legacies Project brought together older citizens from the McGregor home in East Cleveland and those from Cleveland's Fairfax neighborhood with students from Case Western Reserve University. With us is Harry Winfield, an involved and passionate elder resident of Cleveland's Fairfax neighborhood who was selected as an honorary storyteller of the Living Through Legacies Project through his association with the Fairfax Renaissance Development Corporation. Also joining us is Danielle Price, a graduate student at the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences and the Associate Director of the Antioch Development Corporation in the Fairfax neighborhood. She participated in the Living Through Legacies Project as a student biographer, and her subject was Harry Winfield. David Harris, please give us some background on how and when the Living Through Legacies Project came about. And how did you select the title of the project? So the Living Through Legacies Project really came about through a discussion that I had a few years ago with a senior center director down in my hometown of Wadsworth, Ohio. And she said that their intergenerational programming was getting weak. And my friend and I had started a business then that revolved around the idea of connecting youth and elders with technology. And I had this idea in my head that we could do legacies for seniors in our community where we would do oral history interviews, collect photographs, and put those in hardbound book form. The director of our senior center, Nancy Likens, loved the idea. She said, I think we could write a grant and have the support for this from different organizations in town. So we did just that, and my best friend and I, in a period of three months, we archived the books of 10 individuals in Wadsworth. And then we decided that we needed to expand that idea. And we did that with our schools and our library, and we chronicled the histories of 11 more individuals. And we had 18 high school students at that time who assisted in that project. And that was last summer. And then I spoke with Rob Hilton up here in Cleveland, who thought that it would be great if his McGregor Foundation would be able to support this and integrate my education at the Mandel School so that we could expand this here in Cleveland. So my professor Sharon Milligan and I wrote a grant proposal for the McGregor Foundation, and of course it was funded. And that's how the Living Through Legacies Project was born here in Cleveland. Now the name, the Living Through Legacies Project, really comes about because the students who are the biographers for these elders in the community are doing autobiographies for these individuals. They're interviewing and then they're writing narratives in the first person of this individual that is their subject. So they're really, the students are living through the legacy of another person. And then it's of course leaving this tangible book on for future generations. Well, I'm taking it right from there. Harry Winfield, how were you recruited to be part of the Living Through Legacies Project? 
I guess I was recruited through the Fairfax Renaissance Development Corporation. I've been a board member of that group, and I guess they had some familiarity with me, and they thought that uh, I would be uh, a good candidate. <laughs> but um, it's it's been... Uh, beautiful experience. I, I, I was really honored that, uh, that I was even selected or thought about in that way. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, and, and Danielle, as a, a graduate student and as a professional in your role as Associate Director of the Antioch Development Corporation, how did the match occur that brought you and Harry Winfield together for this experience? I think it was fate uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I have um, heard his name come up several times and it just kind of all came together um, coincidentally, I guess if you want to say it that way, it's not coincidental to me, however, Uh, but I attend school with Dave, and we have crossed paths on various projects, and then I saw in the um, Case Daily News uh, that he was looking for the student biographers, and that part of the project would take place in Fairfax, which is where I work and where I attend church and where I do my um, social work practice. And so I was interested on a couple of levels and also because I am working with an intergenerational project as well. So it just seemed like I was getting all of these clues about, hey, maybe I should do something here. (laughs) And so I just responded and I attended uh, Dave's orientation and Harry and I were matched up, and it just turned out that he was the guy that other people were like, you need to get involved with your, him involved in your intergenerational project. And so it kind of all came together. Your, when you say your generational project, what was that? I am working on an intergenerational project in Fairfax. It's a quilting project. Uh, But it is bringing together, it's primarily women who quilt in the various churches that are located in the Fairfax neighborhood and the children who live there, but also residents, all ages of folks are coming together uh, to really help them to understand or learn about the history of their uh, neighborhood, to learn about the art of quilting, uh, to learn about photography. Uh, In the project, they're actually taking pictures in the neighborhood, and then they're going to select Uh, certain pictures and we're going to put those onto fabric and then we're putting them into quilts that represent the neighborhood from the children's perspective. And so I was amazed to find out also that Harry does photography and he does videography and it was just like everything Ah. just kept clicking together and I'm like I really do need him (laughs) and he's been in Fairfax for over 50 years. He's a resident there so he has amazing uh, information Uh, inside information that you can't get from the statistics on the neighborhood so well Harry (laughs) you had it all together (laughs) I've been uh, because of my interests in Fairfax I love the community I've been there for over 50 50 years and anything that occurs that's remotely associated with Fairfax I intend to get it on video, and I've done that since uh, my retirement from the post office in uh, 1988. I've been very active with my community. There's been a lot of changes, developments in the Fairfax area. So, uh, Well, you know, it's... It's really my privilege to be interviewing everyone that I have uh, on Regionally Speaking and in the neighborhoods. And one of the questions I ask is, what keeps you in the neighborhood? I want to ask you that question. What keeps you in the Fairfax neighborhood? You've given us some clues already, but talk a little more about that. Number one... I came to Fair, to the Fairfax area because of its geographical location. 
it's in the center of it all, and I guess that's the reason for my uh, the title of my bi biographical sketch. It's uh, 15 minutes from any uh, point in the city that you would like to be at. Uh, I, for instance, downtown, it takes 15 minutes to get there. If you want to go to one of the shopping uh, malls, another 15 minutes. And then what really kept me there was the cultural interest, uh, yes. university circle, the art museum. I go there like a drunk goes to the bar. It's it's um, it's almost uh, an involuntary act, and my kids have grown up going to the art museum. So mainly, that's uh, that's the reason the the Caramu and uh, the Playhouse. All of those are right in Fairfax, five ten minutes from Fairfax, from where I live. So. Uh, in, in short, I just love the neighborhood, and I, and I love my neighbors. Uh -huh. I've had I, I have good neighbors. Uh, that seems to be at odds with the uh, with the stories that come out of the area. But you can bet I have some good, substantial people that have. I've watched the kids grow up. And uh, just recently, I, I've watched their grandchildren on their prom days uh, yes. or nights, and I had my video camera. And all of this is part of the F Fairfax uh, arena, so, uh, yes. so to speak. Well, you seem to have quite a commitment to the neighborhood. Oh, yes. I mean, the part that, about um, your video work you're recording. It's a way of recording uh, the history of Definitely. that community. Right. Uh, Any time that I have a clue that a major political figure or a major uh, activist is in the area, I'm there. This has been volunteered, and there's no pay involved, and I have an archives of hundreds of tapes that I'm uh, trying to get sequenced so that uh, one day I, I can uh, present this as, uh, as, as a legacy. <laughs> David, that must warm your heart to hear about how what you're doing lives on through other activities and, right. and plans and, and visions that people have. It absolutely does. And Mr. Winfield's example is just one of the many that we have to capture here. And that's why this project is really so important, because it can connect the students with the seniors and the, the cultural aspects of our university circle area with these neighborhoods and with the fine people that surround our campus. <laughs> and you, Danielle, how are you feeling about all of this? I, obviously, I <laughs> am on the same page with Dave because we had not talked to each other previously about our intergenerational interests uh, per se, but we kind of connected because we have that common interest. And I've been a member of Antioch for 16 years, and um, I've been, I work for the Development Corporation there now, and I've been there for nine years. So I have a uh, vested interest in, in the community uh, as well. So, <laughs> Oh, this is a wonderful introduction. And we're going to take a break now, but we'll be back because there's much more to talk about. Regionally Speaking is made possible through the generous support of the Social Justice Alliance Institute, the Case Western Reserve University Advanced Opportunity Grants, and the Case Western Reserve University Center for Community Partnerships. To learn more about the issues facing our region, visit our website at blog.case.edu forward slash WRSS. Welcome back to Regionally Speaking. We're talking about the Living Through Legacies Project, which we view as a fine example of working with university students, community partners, and residents in East Cleveland and the Fairfax neighborhood. 
David Harris, <laughs> what are the critical elements? No one knows this better than you. What are the critical elements that led to the success of this project? Well, I can't go any further without saying that this is a project built on relationships and the power of relationships have really driven this project forward. Um, the relationships internal to Case Western include those to the Mandel School, to the College of Arts and Sciences, to the Center for Community Partnerships, to the Center for Civic Engagement and Learning. And then we have partnerships external to the university that have been crucial. The McGregor Foundation, of course, being the funder, and also the McGregor Home, for we recruited six seniors from there. And then we had the Fairfax Renaissance Development Corporation, where we recruited three seniors. And then we have the Senior Outreach Services in Fairfax, where we recruited three others. So that's really where we got our 12 seniors for participation. I mentioned the partnerships internal to the university that led to the project's success. And those were to mainly recruit the students. Um, we had 19 students, seven from the Mandel School, and let's see, 12 from, from undergrads. And the students come from diverse backgrounds. Um, you name it, their majors included music, um, sociology. We even had an engineer do this project. And of course, the graduate students were all of social work um, interests. So those really led to this project's success. And then having 12 of the most outstanding seniors partake in this and their families, some of their families got very involved in making these books what they are. It's just been a phenomenal experience. You have to talk a little bit more about the books. Okay. So the books are, I always say the books are nice, you know, and, <laughs> and there needs to be more explanation. So the book is, the finished product is a hardbound, eight and a half by 11 size. It's mainly a book that could go on the coffee table to serve as someone's conversation piece in their living room or to be put in the hope chest for future generations. Um, they're full color. They include pictures. Most of them are written in a font that looks like handwriting because I call them books or memoirs because like I've said, these are autobiographies written in the first person of the recipient. And, you know, the, the length of the book, I would say, is anywhere between 40 and 80 pages. Some of the books were very lengthy, but they're all rich in, in content in their own way. Um, whether it's a 40-pager or whether it's an 80-pager, they're equally, equally rich. They're stunning. They are really stunning to look at. And uh, you or um, Harry or Danielle might want to talk about this. I want to know how you compiled them. I mean, I'm very interested in, in oral histories. But this part of it, how you put together the books where you had the oral history and then the complement were these photographs that were from each one of the subjects. They supplied the photographs. Well, Can I chime we'll in? Have yeah, Danielle please, talk Danielle, about talk about that. Uh, Dave was very organized because <laughs> I, when I read the project initially, I was thinking, oh my God, how am I going to be able to do <laughs> all of this? But he had it all mapped out, how many hours it'll take, how many yes. days it'll be. Uh, he had sheets explaining everything. We had a very thorough orientation that went into even the theory behind um, how he came up with the concept. Uh, and then he had the recorders there with instructions in case you forgot how to do it. Uh, he had prepped all of the uh, folks who we were interviewing. So it was really all mapped out very comprehensively. And even the software program, it was done in uh, Mac. And for I'm a PC person. So I had a little concerns about that initially, too. But the software that he selected was so simple to use that it really put the pages together for you. And it was just a matter of us um, working with, with Chin and I. I had a partner, Chin, uh, and, and I working with Harry to select the pictures. And he has a ton of pictures. Since he's a photographer, of course, that part of <laughs> that it was <laughs> it was more difficult to kind of narrow it down to the ones that we thought uh, would best uh, depict the story, uh, but it was it was very comprehensive. All right, <laughs> Harry, take it from there. Well, it was, you know, the thing that really made this an enjoyable experience were 
was Danielle and Chin. Thank you. I, I was impressed with the questions that they asked. They weren't too sensitive. They allowed me to really uh, reveal something. And it was revealing to myself, you know, to, to hear someone ask uh, those those types of questions. Um, um, uh, I was, uh, as she said, and as I'm noted for, I'm a photographer. I have ample pictures. I was just showing her a picture uh, dated 1941 that I carry in my briefcase. And it was it was a party that I had gone to. But to get back to the subject, uh, as as far as um, the project was concerned, it it was a delight for me to participate in it. Uh, I had no idea that uh, that I was thought of in in this way until Dave came to my house and he he was he he really convinced me that uh, you know I needed to to involve myself in this project. You're good, man. You're <laughs> <David>. good. <laughs> I asked you. about yes. that. How were you recruited? Now, um, David, how did you go about you, This is the lead-in now. I'm okay. going to get the story about All right. So the way we did the recruiting, like I said, with our partnerships that I had established um, with the Fairfax Renaissance Development Corporation, Senior Outreach Services, and the McGregor Home, um, I had applications for all the seniors that wanted to do this. Um, Fairfax Renaissance actually s selected their three participants. Uh -huh. um, the McGregor Home made an open lottery where the seniors were able to apply, and then I would randomly select. So the seniors at McGregor were randomly selected. The seniors in Fairfax were selected by either Fairfax Renaissance or Senior Outreach Services. And then instead of just sending them something in the mail from Case Western Reserve saying that here's this project you've been selected to participate, I called them up personally individually, and mm -hmm. went out to their homes <laughs> okay. and met with them for probably half an hour to 45 minutes each, introduced them to this project because I wanted them to feel really comfortable with the idea that they were going to have the university coming in to do this oral history and I didn't want them to think it was going to be exploitive in any way. I wanted them to be very comfortable with the idea that the students they'd be working with are the cream of the crop <laughs> and say la vie. I mean it was it was yeah. great. And that's how it worked. Oh, it was great. Really. I I uh I was first of all I was impressed with Dave as as I said before I you're good, and I'm sure you're going to be successful uh, in your venture with this. But um, I've been with uh, the FRDC, Fairfax Renaissance Development Corporation, since its outset. I think I was one of the, it was originally the New Cleveland Six, and then it evolved into the Fairfax Renaissance Development Corporation. And that's when the funding and, you know, the uh, when we got the grant money from uh, uh, Washington and so forth. But uh, it's been a it's been a great experience. I I, I would recommend it <laughs> to anyone to Thank continue you. with you continue your work, man. This is good. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, go now to. Danielle, again, in your reflection that serves as the preface of Mr. Winfield's memoir, you wrote, meeting Harry was one of those rare, quote, God moments in time when it is crystal clear that something bigger is taking place than what is apparent. Yes, uh, I kind of started talking about that already, just how his name kept coming up to me, which is oftentimes a signal for me to pay attention, like something extra is uh, happening. And then after I met Harry and heard his story, and we went to the same elementary school, we lived in similar neighborhoods growing up. So he had it was just a connection that was unreal that we, and then now that we're both in Fairfax uh, together, um, those things to me just don't happen by chance. 
So that's kind of what I was thinking about. And because I am interested in the Fairfax community, to have somebody standing right in front of me all of a sudden who can tell me the things that I have been trying to find again is not just for me that's a god moment that's a, something bigger than what i could have planned or thought of on my own mm-hmm. so i i have the sense that for all of you <laughs> this is what was really at work here and uh david am i right absolutely you're right um i couldn't have been more blessed to have the fine students and the fine seniors and the fine partners help me drive this project forward and then drive my ultimate culmination, um, which was our Living Through Legacies reception, to be so wonderful and beautiful, where the connections that were made during these three months that the students did these biographies for the seniors really came to fruition. And the celebration was was just, like I said, outstanding. Um, And it was held at our campus's alumni house, which to me is great because usually we deliver these books in the seniors' homes individually. But to do it collectively was was a new path. And to do it in our university's quote-unquote living room was, was another asset because we brought these people from the community onto our campus and we really showed how we're really committed to community involvement for our students. Well, I'm very pleased to say that I was there for that event and I was moved by it and I... I just think of it as one of those extraordinary experiences that I've had at Case Western Reserve University, and particularly to thank all of you for participating today and carrying that story forward in the way that you have. Thank you, David Harris. Thank you, Harry Winfield. And thank you, Danielle Price, all three. It's been (laughs) a great, great pleasure for me. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. You've been listening to Regionally Speaking, a forum that explores the distinctive aspects of Northeast Ohio. Today's program is made possible through the generous support of the Social Justice Alliance Institute, the Case Western Reserve University Advanced Opportunity Grants, and the Case Western Reserve University Center for Community Partnerships. To learn more about the issues facing our region, visit our website at blog.case.edu forward slash WRRS. You can also email your comments, questions, and suggestions to regionally speaking at case.edu. Thanks for listening, and be sure to join us next time for Regionally Speaking. <laughs>